All right, so uh, today we're very grateful to have uh, Eric Sharp here from Virginia Tech, and he's going to tell us about his work on decomposition. All right, well, thank you very much for, for having me today. Um, indeed, I'm going to be talking about uh, something I've been working on for a number of years. About the first half of the talk is basically going to be an overview of what I've been doing on this area for a number of years. And then in the second part, I'm going to specialize to some more recent results in this area. So what am I going to talk about? My talk concerns the application of something called decomposition, a somewhat newish notion, to resolution of anomalies as a pro a proposed by Wang, Wen, and Witten. So what is decomposition? Well, briefly, decomposition is the observation that some quantum field theories are secretly equivalent to sums of other field theories known as universes in this context. When this happens, we say the field theory decomposes and then decomposition can be applied to give insight into its properties. Now, what does it mean for one field theory to be a sum of other field theories? Well, the first thing it means is that the theory contains some topological projection operators um, obeying rules like this. So the product of any projection operator with itself is the same projection operator. Uh, any two different projection operators, their product is zero and the set of projection operators is complete. Given such a set of projection operators, it's straightforward to derive how the correlation functions are going to behave in such a theory. If I start with one correlation function, I can insert the identity as I've done here. Then since these are topological operators and they squared themselves, I can take that single pi i and spread it out to multiply each of those operators O, and then rewrite this correlation function as a sum of correlation functions where each of these O twiddles is now the result of projecting an O under uh, the corresponding pi i. Now, another property is that partition functions will decompose, at least on a connected space time, this takes a simple form. Um, the ordinary partition function, if I think of it schematically as a sum over states, is it will be possible to rewrite this as a sum of partition functions. And we'll take advantage of this later to check decomposition in various examples. Now, the existence of a decomposition reflects a symmetry. In particular, it reflects a higher form symmetry, which I'll come back to in a moment. But before I do so, let me um, clarify the relationship and differences between decomposition and spontaneous symmetry breaking. So in spontaneous symmetry breaking, as I'm sure everyone here knows, there exist things called super selection sectors, which may sound a lot like the universe as I'm mentioning. So in a super selection sector, well, at low energies, you have what looks like just one single, uh, uh, something that sounds like a universe. But the difference is that I can move from one super selection sector to another if I pump enough energy into the system. So super selection sectors are only genuinely disjoint in the infrared or in large volume limits. Um, they're separated by dynamical domain walls. And in particular, although at low energies and large volumes, they look like they might be disjoint from one another, there's really only one single overall quantum field theory. They're all just different phases, if you will, of one larger theory. The idea behind decomposition is different. Um, the universes of decomposition are really meant to be disjoint at all energy scales, and they reflect the idea that there are multiple different field theories present. So I've tried to schematically illustrate the difference between these two setups here. Um, this picture illustrating schematically what a super selection sector would be, some low energy configuration. Whereas here we really have a disjoint union of disconnected objects. Now, there are lots of examples. And in fact, I'm uh, surprised at how many there are. So much of today's talk is going to be concerned with examples and orbifolds, where decomposition typically arises if you have an orbifold in which a subgroup of the orbifold group acts trivially. So uh, we first started looking at this back in 2005, and then recently I revisited this with Daniel, uh, Daniel Robbins and Thomas Vandermeulen in order to understand the work Wang, Wen, and Witten have been doing. But this isn't just orbifolds. This also pops up in gauge theories. For example, if I have a two-dimensional gauge theory with center invariant matter, that turns out to be the same thing as a union of related gauge theories in which I quotient out the center. Um, and also permute the theories by giving them different discrete theta angles. Um, another version of this, there was a more extreme decomposition that was worked out um, just last summer um, in which uh, concerning two-dimensional pure Yang mills. Now, certainly I could apply this first line to two-dimensional pure Yang mills. I could take a pure SO, SU2 theory and relate it to a pair of pure SO3 theories. But these gentlemen pointed out that in fact, there's a more extreme version 
Two-dimensional pure Yang mills can be thought of as a sum of invertible field theories, essentially sigma models on points indexed by the irreducible representations of G. And then there are various other examples. For example, a four-dimensional gauge theory with restriction on instantons. This is, you know, ordinarily you think of this as being somewhat uh, ill-behaved. Obviously restricting instantons is going to violate cluster decomposition, but it turns out there's a fix. Such a theory is equivalent to a disjoint union of four-dimensional gauge theories. Um, is all uh, for reasons I'll briefly come back to later. Now, these aren't the only things. So another example, uh, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this particular point. I'll spend hardly any time on it at all, but I wanted to mention it for historical reasons, if nothing else, because this is how I got into this. If you consider a sigma model on a stack or in particular something called a gerb, uh, that turns out to be the same as a disjoint union of sigma models on spaces. This turns out to be the prototype for uh, a mathematical prototype for many of these things. And decomposition solves some technical issues in making sense of such things. Um, this also pops up in topological field theories. For example, a two-dimensional unitary topological field theory with a semi-simple local operator algebra also decomposes to sigma models on points. So I think this was perhaps most famously described by Moore and Siegel back in 2006. So for example, two-dimensional abelian BF theory at level K turns out to be equivalent to a disjoint union of K copies of sigma models on points with some counter terms that look like deleton shifts that I'm not going to spend any time on. Or for another example that's somewhat more related, two-dimensional dijkraff witten theory is also a sum of invertible theories, a sum of sigma models on points, as many as irreducible representations. And in fact, this is a special case of the orbifolds that I'm going to be describing um, later in this talk. Um, essentially, this is the special case of con uh, corresponding to an orbifold of a point. Now, some fun features. I, I'm, before going on to more serious things, I wanted to take a couple of minutes and just show some of the you know, fun I can have with uh, decomposition. So multiverse interference effects. Um, for example, consider an SU2 gauge theory with center invariant matter. As I've mentioned, that's gonna be the same as a disjoint union of a pair of SO3 theories, each of which has a different discrete theta angle. Now, what does that mean? Or, well, here's one issue with this that might come to your mind. Um, the, there are more SO3 bundles on a Riemann surface than there are SU2 bundles. The possible SU2 bundles are a subset of the SO3 bundles. However, the way the discrete theta angles work is that if I turn on a discrete theta angle, which is what I mean by the minus here, then that gives a, that weights any bundles, any SO3 bundles, which don't come from SU2 bundles by a sign. So in effect, summing over these two theories cancels out the SO3 bundles, which don't arise from SU2. That's part of how this decomposition can actually make sense. Um, some other fun and games. Wilson lines in the um, sort of in the original gauge theory, the amalgamated theory, um, off become in this uh, in the decomposition story defects between universes. So, for example, let's look at two-dimensional abelian BF theory at level K. Now, this has projectors, which I've written here in terms of O's, which are the the local operators, the exponentials of powers of B. Um, the local operators O and the Wilson lines in two-dimensional abelian BF theory obey clock shift commutation relations, which you can find in any number of references. And it turns out if you do just a little bit of algebra, you can rewrite these clock shift commutation relations in this form as a relationship between projectors and Wilson lines. In particular, the clock shift commutation relations imply that if I take a projector and move it past a Wilson line, uh, the effect is to change the projector, um, which is what I've tried to illustrate um, in this picture here. A, uh, the mth universe is connected by that Wilson line to the m plus pth universe. And finally, wormholes between universes. This comes up in uh, gauge linear sigma model constructions. So I'm not going to have the time to go into this in any level of detail, but I wanted to mention it briefly just to give you some idea of the sort of games you can play. So here we consider, a, for example, a U1 uh, gauge theory in two dimensions. Let's suppose this gauge theory has a pair of chirals of charge two and some other chirals char phi of charge minus one say, and we have a super potential that generically gives a mass to the phi's. So generically on the space of P's where the phi's are massive, we have a U1 gauge theory 
um, such that the matter is all invariant under a Z2 subgroup of U1. Since this stuff is all charge two, it's invariant under the sign flips inside U1. So from the story I've outlined so far, you might expect that generically on the space of P fields, one should have um, two copies of the space of P fields, two universes in effect. Um, but that story will break down where this mass matrix has zero eigenvalues. So indeed, that's what we see geometrically. Uh, one has a double cover of, well, in this case, P1, since there are two P fields, um, linked sort of branched over the locus where the phi fields become massless. All right. So I've given you a bunch of examples and illustrated some games, but one basic question you could ask is what do these very different sounding examples all have in common? When is one field theory a sum of other field theories? Well, the answer is that in D space time dimensions, a theory decomposes when it has a D minus one form symmetry. So decomposition and higher form symmetries go hand in hand. Now today, after I get through this, overview, I'm going to specialize to two-dimensional theories. So for most of this talk, I'm going to be, I'll, I'll talk about getting a decomposition whenever a one-form symmetry is present. So to that end, what's a one-form symmetry? I, I suspect everyone there has heard about this before, but in case there are people who haven't, let me spend just a minute talking about this. So intuitively, a one-form symmetry is something like a group that exchanges non-perturbative sectors. So for example, a gauge theory or orbifold in which the matter is invariant under sub subgroup of the orbifold group. So technically, there's some technical caveats which mostly I'm going to gloss over. Um, if this subgroup is central, if that subgroup lies in the center of G, then the non-perturbative sectors are invariant under the following action. I can take any one G bundle and permute it to a different G bundle by tensoring in a K bundle. And since the matter is all invariant under K, these two sectors are going to contribute to the partition function, to the path integral in exactly the same way. Or if you prefer, I could think of this in terms of taking a G gauge field and adding a K gauge field. Now, at least when K is central, this gives an action of the group of K bundles. So instead of talking about the action of elements of a group, we have an action of bundles of groups. And that group is denoted um, in a couple of different ways. In the physics literature, recently people have been denoting it with a uh, superscript one. In the math literature, this notion has been around for ages and it's denoted with a BK. Now, one form symmetries also show up in other places. For example, they show up in the algebra of topological local operators where they're typically realized nonlinearly, but that's a different talk than the one I'll give today. So what are field theories am I going to specialize to today? Well. Um, again, today I'm mostly going to talk about two-dimensional theories, which have one-form symmetries, and mostly I'm going to focus on orbifolds with trivially acting subgroups. Or if you prefer, I could think about these as orbifolds or gauge theories with a non-complete charge spectrum. It, it means the same thing. Now, there are other ways I can think about this in two dimensions. Um, an orbifold or a gauge theory in two dimensions with a trivially acting subgroup is typically the same thing as a theory with restriction on, uh, restriction on instantons, as we will see later. Um, there's another formal way to describe these. I don't want to spend any real time on this, but again, I want to mention this just to give some idea of how this all ties together. We could also think about these in terms of sigma models on gerbs. And I, you know, very briefly, a gerb is a fiber bundle whose fibers are groups of one form symmetries. So if you have a sigma model on a gerb, then since the gerb has a translation symmetry along the fibers, any well-defined sigma model should have a, a global symmetry, which corresponds to that translation symmetry on the target space. And indeed, that's part of how all this ties together. A sigma model on a gerb has a uh, BG symmetry corresponding in the gerb language just to uh, translation symmetries on the, along the fibers. And of course, as I mentioned, this also can be encoded in the algebra of topological local operators that mostly I won't be uh, talking about that today. Now, decomposition often relates these pictures. For example, I mentioned that these can be described as theories with restrictions on instantons. As we will see explicitly in a little while, that restriction on instantons arises as a sort of multiverse interference effect, I sort of laughingly like to say, um, in that the sum over universes that decomposition implements a projection operator which projects out some instantons. So that's uh, having a restriction on instantons and having a decomposition goes hand in hand.
Um, similarly, the one form of symmetry of the field theory can be interpreted as a translation symmetries along the fibers of these gerbs, as I mentioned a minute ago. Um, the relation to trivial group actions is be, uh, can also be understood in the gerb language. Um, I mentioned that gerbs look like uh, a gerb is a fiber bundle whose fibers are copies of this group or thing like a group. Well, mathematically, BG is the same thing as an orbifold of a point by G. So whenever you have something that looks like an orbifold with a trivially acting subgroup or a gauge theory with a trivially acting subgroup, a good intuition for that is that you're fibering copies of this over you know, an ordinary gauge theory or an ordinary orbifold. And if you're fibering copies of this over stuff, then you should expect something like a gerb structure. You should expect this sort of structure should be appearing somehow. Now, since 2005, we've checked decomposition in a lot of different examples and a lot of different kinds of examples in a lot of different ways. And what I wanna do here is just sort of give some overview of some of the many ways this arises and uh, we can understand it. Since I work in, since I started out doing string compactifications, one of the first things we looked at were gauge linear sigma models. So two-dimensional gauge theories. And you can see the structure of decomposition in explicitly in mirrors, and in quantum cohomology rings, where it arises in Coulomb branch computations. Um, and we've seen our original papers discuss this in abelian mirrors. In non-abelian mirrors, we see the same structure, but that's a, a different talk. In orbifolds, as we'll see later today, we can see the structure in partition functions, in massless spectrum computations, and elliptic genera. Um, there's a version of this in open strings and K-theory. If I uh, try to define a D-brain in one of these theories, then I quickly discovered two things. One is that the possible D brains naturally are characterized by which universe they live in. The other is that there are no open string states between universes. Gauge invariance sort of knocks out any open string state that might be between universes. So open strings only connect universes to themselves. Um, uh, this also has a mathematical interpretation in terms of K theory of gerbs. I'm gonna move on. Um, supersymmetric gauge theories, we can see this using localization tricks. Um, we can see this in non-supersymmetric pure Yang-Mills theory, a la McDowell. In fact, since everything can be computed, computed there, one can see this very explicitly. In fact, there are two different flavors of decomposition one can see there. Um, and this paper references um, decompositions of the form um, writing up SU2 with center invariant matter as a sum of SO3s. There's a more extreme version in which Pure Yang Mills is written as a disjoint union of um, invertible field theories of sigma models on points. So other work, uh, Zohar Komargatsky and various collaborators looked at adjoint QCD2 a couple of summers ago. Recently, there've even been numerical tests. Someone took two dimensional gauge theories, put them on a lattice and just and, and found decomposition numerically. There are also versions of all this in higher dimensions, though I'm not going to have the time to really talk about that today. Now, doing a lot of consistency checks is one thing, but if we couldn't do anything with it, then I'd still be wasting my time. So there are applications. Um, the original application was to understand sigma models whose targets are stacks and gerbs, but beyond that, um, this makes predictions for gromov witten theory, for example. There exists a notion of gromov witten theory for gerbs. This makes up an obvious prediction. The gromov witten theory of a gerb had better be the same thing as the gromov witten theory of a disjoint union of spaces with B fields. And that was checked, that's been checked rigorously. Um, that was worked out in a series of papers starting back in 2008. Um, this can be applied to non-perturbative constructions of geometries in gauge linear sigma models. This was the business about wormholes between universes I mentioned a, a few slides ago. And nowadays it's a, a fun sort of standard trick for understanding certain uh, gauge linear sigma models. Now you can get geometries via uh, something other than the, as the critical locus of a superpotential. Um, this arises in elliptic genera. Um, this can be applied to give a, a neat, efficient tr uh, computational tool of elliptic genera in some circumstances, and also has been checked um, extensively in elliptic genera as well. And then today, what I'm going to be focused on really is an application to anomalies. To understand a proposal of Wang, Wen, and Witten for uh, sanitizing or resolving gauge anomalies in orbifold. So that's, that's where this is going to go.
So let me switch gears. So far, I've given you a broad overview of what decomposition is about. Now what I want to do is discuss a specific application to orbifolds, namely to the Wang Wen Witten work I mentioned. So this will not only be an excellent example of a use of decomposition, but this will also give us, um, it will give me an opportunity to, to, pre to present some very concrete examples in which you can see decomposition very explicitly. So my goal for the rest of this talk is really to apply decomposition. Now, what was it Wang, Witten, Witten were doing? Why did I think that decomposition might be relevant here? Well, briefly, the idea of Wang, Witten, Witten is as follows. Suppose I have an orbifold, some, uh, some quotient of a space X by G, and let's suppose there's a gauge anomaly in G. So ordinarily, if there's a gauge anomaly, you know, we stop at go, we can't do anything else. It, it, the orbifold makes no sense. But they had an idea for how to fix it. Um, their idea basically uh, boils down to, you take G and you replace it with a larger group, I'm gonna call gamma, whose action turns out to be anomaly free. So under certain circumstances, you can arrange to find a bigger group with an anomaly free action. It's a little bit more complicated than that. I'm going to illustrate the uh, complications you know, later, but that's, that's the heart of it. We're gonna start with one orbifold that doesn't make sense. We're gonna make the orbifold group bigger. Now that larger group has a subgroup that acts trivially on the target space. That's part of how this is set up. That's part of what it means to define. That's part of what they mean when they talk about an orbifold of X by gamma. And then in that language, their original orbifold group is the quotient of gamma by K. Now, you know, where my ears perked up is that orbifolds with trivially acting subgroups, just like gauge theories with trivially acting subgroups, are standard examples in which decomposition arises. So one expects that decomposition should be relevant. And indeed, that's what we find. So here's my plan for the rest of the talk. I'm first going to describe decomposition in orbifolds with trivially acting subgroups. And this will give me an opportunity to walk through some examples in detail. And then as time permits, I'll add a new modular invariant phase that we're going to call a quantum symmetry because it generalizes the quantum symmetries of, you know, that people talked about in orbifolds back in the late eighties. Um, so it's going to be, it'll be modular invariant like discrete torsion. It will only arise in orbifolds with a trivially acting subgroup. And it would probably be the subject of a talk all on its own were it not for the fact that decomposition is going to uh, basically make it impossible for us to get any new field theories out of this, unfortunately. So then after I've done that, I will review more details of the anomaly resolution procedure of Wang Wen Witten, and then I'll apply decomposition to that procedure. And then we're, what we're going to find very quickly is a very efficient understanding of Wang Wen Witten. So what we'll find is that in two dimensions, um, if we apply the Wang Wen Witten procedure, if I sort of, um, you know, poetically resolve the anomaly, uh, resolve the gauge anomaly in that G orbifold, by replacing it with a gamma orbifold together with some quantum symmetry, that's going to be the same as a field theory of copies and covers of orbifolds by non-anomalous subgroups as a consequence of decomposition. Or, or put another way, if I wanted to be, with all due apologies to the authors, if I wanted to be very slightly snarky about it, I might say that there are two different ways one could imagine of fixing a gauge anomaly. One is the Wang Wen Witten procedure. I make the orbifold group bigger, I turn on a quantum symmetry, I arrange all the pieces to cancel the anomaly. Or there's sort of a dumb thing I could do, which is instead of orbifolding by the whole anomalous group, orbifold by a non-anomalous subgroup. I mean, that would also give me an orbifold that would also not have an anomaly. And the fun thing for me is those two different approaches turn out to be equivalent to one another. So this, for, to my mind, is a, a simple understanding of why Wang Wen Witten works. Okay. Now, decomposition in orbifolds in two dimensions. Let me begin by discussing ordinary orbifolds without extra phases. So no discrete torsion in the original orbifold, no quantum symmetries. I'm gonna need a more complicated version later, but let me start here and build up. So let's consider an orbifold X mod gamma with no discrete torsion, anything else, where gamma has a subgroup that acts trivially. So I'll express this mathematically like so. Um, K, the subgroup K doesn't have to be central in general, though later for simplicity, I'll specialize to that. Then in this case, the statement of decomposition is that the gamma orbifold 
is equivalent to this orbifold, a G orbifold of X cross K hat. Now K hat is meant to be the set of isomorphism classes of irreps of K. G has an action on K. Given any one irreducible representation, I can conjugate the, the thing the irreducible representation is acting on to get um, potentially a different irreducible representation. And then these little omega hats down here turn out to be discrete torsion phases. Um, you know, we, have a, uh, we have a precise prediction, not only for this form of the decomposition, but also for the form of the discrete torsion phases. The details are beyond the scope of what I can I have time to talk about today. Um, now, I claim there's a decomposition. Well, from what I told you at the beginning, I'd better be able to give you some projectors. And that's actually pretty straightforward. Um, here they are. The projectors, in fact, follow from uh, known mathematics. The projectors basically turn out to be a consequence of something called Wedderburn's theorem for the center of the group algebra. So it's easy to route down projectors in this case. Now, if K is in the center, we can specialize, we can simplify the story a little bit. If K is in the center of gamma, then the G action on K hat turns out to be trivial because that conjugation action I mentioned does nothing. And then decomposition specializes to this simply looking statement. We get as many universes as irreducible representations of K. Um, and now the discrete torsion also turns out to be simpler. We'll see details later. And in general, we'll get both copies and covers of the G orbifold. Now, to make this concrete, what I want to do next is walk through the details in a particular example where everything can be made completely explicit. So let's consider an orbifold by the eight element dihedral group. Now that dihedral group has a Z mod two center. Let's assume that that center acts trivially on X. Now for the reasons I outlined at the beginning, this is going to have a BZ2 one form uh, symmetry because we have an orbifold with a trivially acting Z2. Furthermore, if we take the dihedral group and quotient out by that center, what we get is a Z2 cross Z2. So whatever the result's gonna be, it's reasonable to expect that it should be closely related to a Z2 cross Z2 orbifold. Now decomposition predicts, if you plug into that general statement I made earlier, it predicts that the field theory of the D4 orbifold should be two copies of Z2 cross Z2 orbifolds, one without discrete torsion, and one with it with discrete torsion, basically because that uh, trivially acting subgroup is central inside D4. So that's the claim. Let's check this explicitly. Now, first off, let me give you some projection operators. I said that projectors are the, you know, at the heart of why you expect a decomposition. So what are the projectors? Well, let me let Z hat denote the dimension zero twist field that's associated to the generator of that trivially acting Z2. So Z hat squares to one, and then using that relation, you can build projection operators, which have this form. It's a specialization of that Wedderburn theorem formula I gave earlier, and it's easy to check that these have all the right properties. So that's good. That tells us that the field theory is going to decompose into two pieces, but it doesn't tell me what the pieces are. So to see what the pieces are, let's next compare partition functions. So to do that, I need to give a little more information about the dihedral group. Let me write it explicitly like this. Let me let Z denote the element that generates the center of that Z2 center of the dihedral group. And let's let the rest be generated by two elements I'll call A and B. So then the remaining elements are, well, A times the center, B times the center, the product of those two generators, A, B, and then the product in the opposite order, B, A, which turns out to be the same thing as A, B times Z. And that's, that's everything, that, that's all eight elements. Furthermore, for simplicity, let's take the two-dimensional space-time to be a two torus. One can repeat this computation in higher genus, you get the same answer, but the combinatorics is uh, more disgusting than I want to try to give in a talk. So for the moment, let's just focus on a two torus. Now the partition function of any orbifold in a two torus has this simple form. Um, it's just one over the order of the group times a sum over sectors, um, we're going to sum over, the sectors are labeled by commuting pairs of group elements. And we think of each of these sectors, I, I suspect you all already know this, but in case there are young people in the audience, let me walk through this anyway. These sectors are basically path integrals over maps from the two torus into the target where there are branch cuts. Put another way, um, in this particular schematically, this is a path integral um, in which I'm summing over maps from the square and X such as the image of this side and this side are related by G, and the image of that side and that side are related by H. Um, 
the power just went out here, but hopefully I still have an internet connection. So, um, so we can think, again, we can think about these ZGHs as sigma models with branch cuts. And what I'm going to do is argue that the partition function of the D4 orbifold is a sum of partition functions of Z2 cross Z2 orbifolds, one with discrete torsion, the other without. Now, um, it'll be useful to, for me to give the elements of Z2 cross Z2 a name. Uh, I'm, just gonna, I'm going to write them with bars on top so that A bar just means the image of either A or AZ under the projection map. Now, since Z acts trivially, these ZHs are symmetric under multiplication by Z. After all, these only know about boundary conditions. So since Z acts trivially, multiplying in a Z changes, does not change the boundary condition. So this sector, this sector, this sector, and this sector have to make the same contribution to the path integral. There's, there's no way they can't contribute in the same way. Now, notice there's a simple way to get between these sectors. So uh, setting, aside certain isomorph setting aside certain automorphisms coming from, uh, realized in this case by conjugation, each of these sectors corresponds to a D4 bundle. And I can get between these different D4 bundles by tensoring in Z2 bundles. So to get between this sector and this sector, what I do is I tensor in a Z2 bundle, which I've schematically illustrated like here. And I can similarly get from there to there and there to there, and I can skip between, I can you know, permute these different sectors that all contribute in the same way to the path integral. Now, this is the BZ2 one form symmetry. This is um, exactly what the one form symmetry means in this case. It's a permutation symmetry amongst the different uh, non-perturbative sectors. It's a statement that um, multiple non-perturbative sectors will contribute the same way and that they can be, or that they can be interchanged and make the same contribution to the path integral. Now, that's good so far. Each sector that appears is the same as a Z2 cross Z2 sector that appears. And because I can multiply a Z on an either side, that means each of these, each sector that appears, appears the multiplicity four. Now, not all sectors can appear. Here are some sectors that can't appear. The, these are sectors, specifically, these are sectors in the Z2 cross Z2 orbifold that don't appear in the D4 orbifold. They would appear in a Z2 cross Z2 orbifold. However, if I try to implement this in a D4 orbifold, well, A bar and B bar would have to come from A and B inside D4, or I could multiply in some Zs. But if we look up here at the multiplication table, A, B, and B, A are not the same thing in D4. And multiplying in elements of the center doesn't change that. So there is no D4 sector that corresponds to these Z2 cross Z2 sectors. Some of the Z2 cross Z2 sectors are omitted. So in particular, this exhibits a restriction on non-perturbative sectors of the sort I've mentioned earlier. The Z2 cross Z2 orbifold has more non-perturbative sectors than the D4 orbifold does. And we can see that very explicitly in this computation. Oh, the power just came back on. All right, so we have a, uh, so let me put these pieces together. So far, I've got this partition function on a two torus of the D4 orbifold looks like, well, some factors, which turn out to be two times the partition function of a Z2 cross Z2 orbifold, except we drop some sectors. It turns out the sectors we omit form a modular orbit. There's no issue, there's no uh, worries about modular invariance here. You know, back in the day, that was something that required some checking, but that work was done 15 to 20 years ago now, and suffice to say it worked out, and I don't think people find it surprising anymore, but you know, back in the day, it was something to check. In any event, um, what I wanna, the point I want to make here is that this is a different theory than the Z2 cross Z2 orbifold. Um, and again, this is something people probably take for granted nowadays, but back when I was first giving talks on this, probably for the first decade I was giving talks on this, people found this very surprising that physics knows when we gauge even a trivially acting group. So the only difference between the D4 and the Z2 cross Z2 is that D4 has a trivially acting Z2. And yet the D4 orbifold is different from the Z2 cross Z2 orbifold. Now, nowadays we could state this more compactly by saying that the D4 orbifold has a symmetry not possessed by the Z2 cross Z2 symmetry uh, theory. Specifically, it has a one form symmetry. And this is what the presence of that symmetry means very concretely. But um, again, for historical reasons, if nothing else, I've given too many talks on, on this particular subject. I wanted to emphasize that you know, this really is a different theory. Physics really does understand. It really does see trivially acting groups. <laughs>
Eric, um, yes. Could, could you could you have defined the right hand side without knowing about the connection with D four? Um, um, yes. Um, if I, I I could have taken the I could have played the game. Uh, some extra, a little more care would be required, but I, I could have played the game of starting with a perfectly consistent partition function and then just dropping a modular orbit of some twisted sectors. The result would be another modular invariant partition function. Uh, one would need to worry about how this was defined at other genera. I mean, if I if I just played this game, all I've all I've told you how to do is all I've done so far is tell you how to define this in a two torus. If I wanted to start on the right hand side and build a theory in that fashion. I'd have to tell you how to do this same thing on any other Riemann surface. So we'd have to have a longer discussion about how to, you know, what this really means, how to define this for arbitrary Riemann surfaces, for example. But you know, if I, if I can give you such a way of doing that, and actually, you know, with hindsight, I I can now, then one could define a theory in terms of a set of modular invariant partition functions that you associate to Riemann surfaces. You could, you could build things that way. It's, it's not how I prefer to think about it because it would be a, a huge pain in the neck, but I mean, you could, you could do things like that. You know, bearing in mind though, that you have to be careful to, um, you know, just giving the two torus result would not nearly be sufficient to uh, define the theory. There's more stuff I would have to tell you, but I mean, you know, with, the with the benefit of hindsight, I can, I can know how to fill in these details I know how to fill in these details, certainly in the D4 case and in other cases that arise in this fashion. Mm. So, so, so you really, I mean, can I interpret that as you're saying back in the beginning of the study of orbital holes where, where people realized, oh, in addition to Z2 cross Z2, you could have turned on discrete torsion. You're saying that you could have done this as well. Yeah, yeah. It now, the, it, it, it would have been more work to do it this way. The nice thing about discrete torsion is that in principle, you got a, phase not only for a two torus but for other Riemann surfaces as well and that was you know, uh, you know perhaps a bit more difficult to dig out of Kerman's original paper but in principle it was there whereas here if all I you know I, you know there were people who thought about you know, as you know there were people who thought about building um, modular invariant partition functions and I have not asked them but I would certainly assume that you know to play that game, they would have had to think not only about a two torus, but Riemann surfaces of other genus, for example. Um, but yeah, in principle, back in the day, if people had wanted to, if people you know, had wanted to, they could have defined theories by subtract, you know, by playing games with, basically all I'm doing is finding a new module, by finding a new modular invariant. I, I, I it's, um, I'm, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so now let me write this in a more compact fashion. So I'm going to add in some discrete torsion. And again, for this audience, people probably already know this, but let me do this quickly and then I'll, uh, unfortunately I have to skim through the rest. So I, I can add the game as Sav just mentioned, I play the game of Sav, as Sav just mentioned of turning on some phases that are known as discrete torsion and are classified by some Greek co uh, uh, group cohomology group. Um, in a Z2 cross Z2 orbifold, Discrete torsion lives in, the choices of discrete torsion are classified by this group cohomology group, which turns out to be a Z2. And the non-trivial element of discrete torsion turns out to act as a sign on these particular sectors, which lo and behold are the same sectors that were deleted in this construction. So that means I can get this partition function, um, the subtracting out the sectors, even that factor of two, by adding together the partition functions of a pair of Z2 cross Z2 orbifolds, one with discrete torsion, one without, the effect of discrete torsion is to take the sectors I want to omit, multiply them by signs. So when I add the two partition functions together, that, that, and that get canceled out in the sum. Um, the remaining sectors get multiplied by a factor of two, but lo and behold, that actually matches what we computed in that fashion. So in particular, in, this, in the language of decomposition, adding these two universes together, adding the two Z2 cross Z2 orbifolds together projects out some sectors. It's a, an interference effect um, between those contributions to the D4 orbifold. Now, uh, and in particular, this matches the prediction of decomposition earlier. It said that the D4 orbifold should be the sum of a pair of Z2 cross Z2 orbifolds. Now, this is just a computation on a two torus. 
you can do the same thing at higher genus. You get the same result. Um, it's just a lot of combinatorics. Let me mention one other game you could play. It's easy to compute the massless spectrum. Um, at least if I give you a specific X, nothing I've said so far really said anything about choices of X. So let's take our covering space to be a six torus. And then it's easy to compute the massless spectrum. There are standard tricks. I mean, one could, one could wonder whether the standard tricks actually apply if there's a trivial acting subgroup. And again, there was a story back in the day and a lot of hanging, hand wringing, but at the end of the day, it works. And here's the result, which I've expressed in the form of a Hodge diamond, because what can I say? I grew up doing string compactifications. Now there's something funny about this Hodge diamond. It has twos in the corner. The Hodge diamond of a, of a connected space would have ones in the corner. The fact I have twos here is a signal that geometrically, this is describing one space, it's describing two of them. Um, physically, this also is signaling an issue with cluster decomposition, but I'll leave that for another talk. Now we can also compute the massless spectrum of each of those two Z2 cross Z2 orbital folds of a six torus. This was worked out by you know, other people, Voff and Witten, for example, years and years and years ago. And it turns out when you add these two uh, Hodge diamonds together, lo and behold, you get the Hodge diamond for a D4 orbital fold. So again, it matches the prediction of decomposition. And really, honestly, once you know that the partition functions match, this has to be the case. But I wanted to say this explicitly just to drive this the point home. Eric, there's a unique identity operator still. I mean, there's a unique vacuum in the C. There, there are two. That's that's what there's a. I mean, it, it, described as an orb described as a D4 orbifold. You could say that there's. Um, uh, you know, there's the original vacuum, but then the twist field for the Z2 center is also of dimension zero. So you use that fact to build the projectors. So there are multiple dimension zero operators. In the language of the original D4 orbifold, fold, there's you know, one thing that's acting as a vacuum in the sense of that D4 orbifold, fold, but because you have a twist field that's of dimension zero, that means that in effect you have multiple vacua, two different vacua. That's, that's part of how this is all tying together. So two different, yeah. Does that signal a pathology in that CFT? Yes, or? it signals a violation of cluster decomposition. Oh, okay. This was the headache way back when. This was, um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a long, long story associated with uh, this particular point specifically. Um, ordinarily, you know, if, if a student came to me ordinarily with a massless spectrum computation with multiple dimension zero operators, Usually I'd, I'd pat them on the head and say, well, that's very nice, but you made a mistake, go back and try again. Um, so yeah, straightening out that there, real, that there really is a two in the corner was, was a bit of a headache back in the day. Um, you know, some of the things we sweated over were things like, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe that second, maybe the trivially acting Z2 really is not generating a new twist field. But then if you try thinking about multi-loop, that, that turns out to screw up multi-loop factorization in orbifolds. So I mean, if the trivially acting Z2 is not giving you a dimension zero uh, twist field, then in effect, target space unitarity is breaking down. I mean, there's some, uh, there's some long uh, story we walked through way back in the day. Um, you know, this, this also ties into math. There were mathematicians thinking about um, you know, how to define, you know, formal products on twist fields and orbifolds, folds. And part of what they were doing was to um, assume that this actually works in this particular fashion. And the physicists who looked at this sort of tore their hair out and said, look, you've, you've got multiple uh, identity operators that there, there must be a problem. Your, that assumption must be there's a long story behind that, which I, I'm, I don't have the time to describe, but if you're curious, you know, let's zoom sometime later and I'm happy to um, walk through it. But yeah, there's, um, it does signal a potential pathology, a violation of cluster decomposition. Um, sorry, I guess to get to the point, um, if you have multiple universes, you also have multiple identity operators. You're also violating cluster decomposition but in an extremely mild and controllable fashion. You know, if I have a sigma model on whose target is just a discon is disconnected, yeah, technically you're violating cluster decomposition. Technically you have multiple vacua, but who cares? I mean, it's, it's under complete control. I mean, you, the good way to think about it is you just have two different theories. So that's part of how this is all tying together. This, this ordinarily does, you would think of this as signaling a pathology, 
but the fact that this is equivalent to a disjoint union of two spaces is the is why you can nevertheless deal with that particular pathology. Mm. All right, so um, I'm beginning to run a bit short on time. I'll just quickly give another example. Um, let's suppose the trivially acting subgroup is not in the center. Then in general, what will happen is the universes don't have to look the same. Um, you can get, in this case, uh, an orbifold by the eight element quaternions, where a Z4 subgroup acts trivially. Two of the universes you get are Z2 orbifolds. The other is an X. So you get different universes. A good way to think about this in this case is that this is a double cover of an X mod Z2. Um, and again, that's, it's easily checked at arbitrary genus. I don't have the time, but if you're curious, I'm happy to set up a Zoom afterwards with anyone who wants to hear about it. Now, um, so far, I've outlined how decomposition works in orbifolds with trivially acting subgroups and no discrete torsion or other phase modifications. I've got about 10 minutes left. Let me sort of quickly walk through what happens if you turn on phases. So let's suppose I have an orbifold by gamma where some subgroup acts trivially. Let me assume that subgroup is central just for reasons of sanity. And now let me turn on discrete torsion in this orbifold. There's a similar story. It breaks up into about three cases. Um, in each case, again, in general, there's some sort of decomposition. The, for, the predictive formula for that decomposition takes a different form. Um, in fact, there's a, a straightforward way in hindsight to derive all of these cases, which I don't have the time to walk through. Um, and it's been checked in a whole bunch of examples. This is the starting point for the work I've been doing with Daniel Robbins and Thomas Vandermeule in this past year as we started to try to wrap our head around uh, the Wang Wen Witten story. Now, um, what I want to do is talk about anomaly resolution. Now, um, again, the idea of Wang Wen Witten is they start with an orbifold with a gauge anomaly. They're going to replace the original orbifold group by a bigger group with nice properties, and they're going to add some phases. Now, because gamma has a subgroup that acts trivially, an orbifold by gamma without any extra phases will decompose into copies and covers of X mod G. But if X mod G was anomalous, that won't help. So we need to add some new phases, which is what I'm going to describe next. So the new phases we add are what I'm calling quantum symmetries. And uh, these were also worked out by uh, Yuji Tachikawa just uh, not too long ago. So a quantum symmetry in this context is going to be a new modular invariant phase that exists in orbifolds in which a subgroup acts trivially. These are going to be classified by elements of group cohomology um, analogously to discrete torsion, but a different group cohomology group than discrete torsion. And its action looks like this. So before, if Z acted trivially, then I said that this sector and this sector were the same. Um, what a quantum symmetry is going to do is add a phase relating this sector to this sector, where this phase corresponds to an element of that group cohomology group. This turns out to generalize the old notion of quantum symmetries from the, the late 80s. Um, those all turned out to be determined by discrete torsion. These aren't. Um, I'm running a bit short on time, so let me just um, skip to some of the points. Um, so specifically, the quantum symmetries, we can characterize the quantum symmetries that are, that are of the old-fashioned sort. They're in the image. So the quantum symmetries live in this group here. Mathematically, there's a, a long exact sequence you can write down. It's an extension of the old inflation restriction exact sequence, if anyone here cares. Um, uh, the old... Uh, 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 the old examples, the old quantum symmetries are basically the images of this map. And what we're going to need for anomaly cancellation are going to be quantum symmetries whose image under this map is non-trivial. And because the sequence is exact, old fashioned quantum symmetries won't help. The, the image of this are all going to be in the kernel of that. And I don't have the time to walk through uh, old fashioned quantum symmetries, so let me move on. Now, decomposition. How does decomposition work in the presence of a quantum symmetry? Here's the answer. Um, if I have a gamma orbifold with a trivially acting central subgroup K, and I've turned on some quantum symmetry, then decomposition makes the following prediction for the result, where this quantum symmetry, well, it's an element of this group, cohomology group, but this is the same thing as homomorphisms from G and irrupts of K. So as because this looks like this. Uh, that's, I can use that to make sense of kernel of B and co-kernel. What I mean by the kernel of B is I think of B as a map from G into K hat, and then I take its kernel. So the kernel of B is going to be a subgroup of G, 
whose image under the quantum symmetry is trivial. And this turns out to be more or less uniquely determined by consistency with previous results. Um, on one of the slides I flipped right through, um, the field theory of a gamma orbifold with discrete torsion takes this form. I told you that turning on discrete torsion can be equivalent to some special cases of quantum symmetries. So in those special cases, we better get the same result. And indeed, it turns out we do. Um, if the quantum symmetry is, um, if that B is beta of a discrete torsion element, this reduces to this. Now, uh, yes. Uh, when K is central, does this reduce to the earlier uh, example you were showing? No, uh, when K is central, this, is, is th this already assumes that K is central, oh. um, uh, just for, for simplicity. So uh, the, what the difference is before, and what I had before did not have a quantum symmetry turned on. So turning on a quantum symmetry changes the structure of how decomposition works. And that turns out to be essential for the Wang Wen Witten story. But does this have anything to do with sort of a general extension, right? I mean, when you have a general extension, you have your H2 class, and you also have this sort of automorphism action. Is this related it, to that? It oh. does. Um, in fact, there's a, a beautiful way of understanding that. Um, there's a really beautiful way of understanding that in the original case. Um, um, I've got about three minutes left before a bunch of people have to go. We can so talk ask, ask, me that, ask me that question again in about five minutes. Um, if great. you can stick around, and if you can't stick around, just uh, email me and we can set up a Zoom and talk about it later. There, there is a beautiful way in how all that ties together. I don't have the time to describe it. Cool. Um, so there are examples. I don't have the time. Um, we've checked this in many, many examples. And what I had here was an outline of one particular example. But let me see if I can get to the point of this. So uh, we have the tools to start applying to anomalies. Now, how is that going to work? Well. Anomalies in a finite G gauge theory in n plus one dimensions turn out to be classified by group cohomology, specifically degree n plus two cohomology of G valued in U1. Um, and that turns out to be part of the story. Let me skip over how that works in quantum mechanics. Ah, so suppose we have an orbifold in two dimensions, which is anomalous that anomaly lives in degree three group cohomology of G. Here's the wang win witten algorithm. Uh, wang win witten say, to, re to fix that anomaly, we first extend G to a larger group gamma, where gamma is chosen so it, such that the pullback of the anomaly is trivial. The idea then is to replace that G orbifold with a gamma orbifold by a need to describe how gamma acts on X. And if, gamma, if K acts trivial on X and I do nothing else, then ordinary decomposition applies. We just get copies of the G orbifold and nothing good has happened. So we have to add a quantum symmetry. So the second step of the wang wen witten procedure is to turn on a quantum symmetry, which we choose such that its image under that map D2 from a few slides ago is the anomaly. This turns out to imply that the pullback of the anomaly is trivial. So in this case, K acts trivially on the space but non-trivially on twisted sector states via B. It's a, it's a quantum symmetry. And then these two get together, the extension plus B resolve the anomaly. So formally, if we apply decomposition, well, decomposition says that the gamma orbifold with a quantum symmetry should be this. However, if the image of B is the anomaly, then the restriction of the anomaly to the kernel of B is automatically zero. So the kernel of B is by construction, an anomaly-free subgroup of G. And so this side is automatically anomaly-free. So we get immediately that the gamma orbifold with, the, with a quantum symmetry gives rise to copies of, the, of orbifolds by anomaly-free subgroups. That's, a, that's how I think about Wang Wen Witten in two dimensions. Now, in the rest, I just have some examples. Let me just quickly outline one, and then I'll get to the summary slide because I think people have to get out of here. Um, let's consider the case of an anomalous Z2 cross Z2 orbifold. The anomaly lives in degree three group cohomology, which turns out to be a Z2 cubed. And in fact, the elements, the generators of that Z2 cubed basically correspond to the three Z2 subgroups of Z2 cross Z2. Let's imagine extending that Z2 cross Z2 to a D4 with the trivially acting central Z2, and then turn on some quantum symmetry. And here in this table, I've enumerated all the possibilities with that extension. The first line is no quantum symmetry. This is the, the trivial case. 
in this case, the image is trivial. No anomaly can be resolved. Depending upon whether or not we turn on discrete torsion, we'll get copies of the original G orbifold. That's no good. However, for these two cases, the image of D2 is non-trivial. So we can resolve an anomaly if it lives inside that subgroup. And then what decomposition predicts is that we get orbifolds by subgroups that do not include this. So we get only anomaly-free subgroups. Now, the spectrum of things you get depends upon the choice of extension and the choice of quantum symmetry. So for example, if I extend to the eight element group of quaternions, then I get a different table of possibilities, um, but the results have the same flavor. If the quantum symmetry is non-trivial, then the orbifolds I get all are anomaly free. This is a B orbifold, but the anomaly does not lie in here. And again, decomposition doesn't care about whether there's an anomaly. Decomposition is just a general statement about orbifolds, but if we apply it in this case, we can walk around the anomaly. And then I have some more examples, but I think my time is up. So let me just summarize. Um, if you all only remember one thing from this talk, that one thing should be that decomposition says one field theory, something you might've thought was just one theory is secretly multiple different theories. If you can remember two things from this talk, the second thing should be that decomposition appears in n plus one dimensional theories with n form symmetry. So I focused on two dimensional examples, but this also works in other cases. And then if you remember only three things from this talk, the third thing should be that decomposition can be applied to understand Wang Wen Witten's work. Uh, they replace a, an anomalous G orbifold with a non-anomalous gamma orbifold with a quantum symmetry, but decomposition says that that's the same thing as copies of orbifolds by anomaly-free subgroups, which are explicitly non-anomalous. And since I'm now out of time, let me stop there and ask if there are questions. Yeah, are there any uh, questions for the speaker? Uh, I have one one quick quick question. So, sure. in the case of uh, uh, Wang Wen Witten, mm -hmm. uh, what happens if G doesn't have a normally free subgroup? Then the algorithm algorithm simply doesn't work, or uh, there can be a more extended method. Or, or or it gives you the original space. I mean, I I I I have to look at a particular example, but I mean, in general terms, the other thing that can happen is that uh, the kernel, if there is no anomaly free subgroup, then the kernel of B has to be trivial. And then you'll just get copies of X. So mm -hmm. you'll get no orbifold at all. That's, that's certainly something that can happen in general. Okay, I see, thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Any other quick questions? I have some extended questions, but... Uh... But since people have to go, yeah. Yeah, uh, Yeah. if I may ask another quick question. So you go mentioned the uh, connection between decomposition and the restrictions on the uh, instant on sum. Mm -hmm. And often it is also possible to understand the restrictions on the instant on sum as coupling the original theory some TQFT. Yes, yes. Then I was wondering if you thought about, uh, or you have comment up, can make a comment about the connection between decomposition and, you know, in the language of coupling the original theory to TQFT. Yes, uh, there, you, you can set things up that way. Um, you know, for example, uh, these particular theories I've been discussing, orbifolds with trivially acting subgroups, you can think of as, um, at least poetically, a coupling to two-dimensional dicraft witten theory. And then you can make that sort of poetic intuition more precise if you look at the partition functions. So the partition function for two-dimensional dicraft witten theory looks like a sum over irreducible representations of the, orb of the, the group um, weighted by some function of the dimension of the representation and the order of the group. It's a ratio raised to the power of the Euler characteristic of the Riemann surface you're on. Um, a good way to think about that that's going to, that I'll generalize in a moment is that that ratio of the order of the orbifold group to the dimension of the representation, um, that's, uh, you can think about that as a, a, a dilaton shift of a sigma model on a point. So given any two dimensional field theory, I can add a counter term that looks like uh, just a constant times uh, the uh, 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 Ricci scalar on the world sheet. Uh, so in a string theory, we would interpret that as a dilaton shift, but I don't have to do this in a string theory. I could do this in a just any random two-dimensional quantum field theory. I always have the 
uh, freedom to at least any random yeah any random field theory I could always have the freedom to turn on such a counter term. So one way of thinking about two-dimensional digraph Witten theory, and bear with me for a second, I'll get back to the coupling, is that those factors appearing in the sum, that ratio of the order of the group to the dimension of the representation raised to the power of the Euler characteristic, that is exactly a, um, a dilaton shift. Now, um, in the case of more general partition functions, I, I worked out explicitly uh, for example, the part, or wrote down the partition functions on a two torus for that D4 orbifold and the quaternionic orbifold. Um, if you do the same computation at higher genus, you'll find that there are extra factors which can also be interpreted as dilaton shifts. Now, you know, they're counter terms. We don't usually care about counter terms. So um, usually when I give talks on this, I just suppress them. I can, you know, always just you know, pick another counter term. I can always uh, remove them. But in principle, there's those, there are a canonical sort of values for those counter terms you get from uh, in a D4 orbifold with a trivial acting subgroup in any of these orbifolds with a trivial acting subgroup. And in fact, those, those terms you get um, can be literally understood through a generalization of the dijkraff witten partition function. So uh, phrase another way, if you compute the partition function of one of these orb folds with a trivially acting subgroup on some general Riemann surface, not just a, a two torus, but in general, what you get looks like a sum over contributions from the different universes weighted by factors raised to the power of the Euler characteristic. And the, what those factors look like is a ratio of the order of the trivially acting subgroup to the dimension of the representation associated with that particular universe. It's the same form as you see in dijkraff witten And in fact, there's a general formula. I, I, I don't have it at my fingertips, but you know, I can give me five minutes to look it up and I can write it down for you. There's a general formula I can write down for partition functions of orbifolds and even some gauge theories in two dimensions, um, which essentially generalizes the form of the dijkraff witten partition function. It, it implements in a very precise way the, uh, the intuition that these orbifolds with trivially acting subgroups should be understandable as uh, couplings of you know, an ordinary physical theory to some topological field theory, in this case, to two-dimensional dijkraff witten theory. Um, I'm tempted to write it up, but you know, a paper just on dilaton shifts, I, I'm, I'm tempted to write it up. I, I'm not certain where I could get it published. So I, for which reason I've, I've, I've hesitated to try to put it on the archive, but, um, um, but if you're curious, you know, email me later and I can, I can send you the exact formula. You get a generalization of two-dimensional dijkraff witten that implements the intuition that these orbifold with trivially acting subgroups should be couplings of physical theories to topological field theories. I see. Oh, thank you very much. All right. Well, let's uh, thank the speaker one more time.